Welcome again to Tech Talks. Today I have with me Yemi Johnson. Yemi Johnson is one of the founders of FCC Health, uh, formerly First Cardiology, and it has been around since 2008. Dr. J, welcome to Tech Talks, and thank you for coming on. So, thank um, you. you came to you came back to Nigeria from uh, from the States um, to start um, First Cardiology, but now FCC Health. Clearly, you've expanded. Um, so, what has the journey been like? Let's start off with that. 15 years in Nigeria. Okay. Um, in simple terms, it has been the most difficult thing I've ever tried to do coming mm. back home mm. and trying to start a state of the art uh, cardiology in Nigeria. Been difficult but very fulfilling. And um, I'm happy I made the move to come back. So, um, any experience, I mean, so like, if I look at the state of, I mean, like when you came back, what was the state of, you know, healthcare, especially in that your field, and what is it like today, and what has contributed to any of the changes, positive or negative? Okay, let me give you some background. My, my specialty is called interventional cardiology, which is, which means we go into the heart, without cutting you open. We go through the blood vessels and go in there and fix whatever has to be fixed. Uh, that specialty was not available in Nigeria when I came. I was, that was one of the main reasons I came back home. And now in the US, we, I was in a group where there were 18 cardiologists in Charlotte, North Carolina, there were 18 of us. And there were six of us who did interventional cardiology. Of those six, three were Nigerian. And I found it incredible that we were all here doing all these highly skilled uh, specialties, but nothing going on back home. So I made a decision to come back home and see how we could start it in Nigeria. So, um, COVID, um, pre COVID. So let's talk about pre COVID and after COVID. I mean, what has, I mean, like, in terms of awareness now, because I think one of the things that COVID has, has done is created more awareness about people's health, whether it's physical or, or, or mental. What was that experience for you? The like, COVID experience or the whole pre, the whole, pre everything, uh, during, pre, during and, and uh, now, post. now, post? Well, pre-COVID, there were a few of us like me who came back, the aspirants they call us, uh, who came back to try and uh, improve the standards and um, there's one clear thing we have the man we have the skill we have the people but they're all like, most mostly abroad because there's no infrastructure to work with back home so slowly infrastructure started to develop then COVID came everything came to a standstill uh, worst part of my professional career ever it was horrible but COVID did a few things it made Nigerians realize that we've got to fix our own health care. The guys who could afford to go abroad couldn't go abroad. They were stuck here. And then they found out that there's actually expertise in town. And um, it exposed them to some of us who were around showing that we could do these things here. So a heart attack, anything in cardiology can be done in Nigeria now, except maybe heart transplant. And uh, that will be coming in, in due course. So the COVID stopped everything. The whole country, the whole world came to a standstill. Consumable supply chain broke down and we had to fend for ourselves. And it did improve the quality of healthcare in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. It did because we had to do things for yeah. ourselves. And then it showed that things were available. And that's where technology came in. And um, all the people looking after COVID, we had a COVID ICU, which is, you know, the really sick people, all of them, most of the people on life support. And at that time, nobody knew really how to treat COVID. So all the ICUs around the world, we used to communicate, show our labs, show what's going on, and then we all put heads together and uh, try and figure out what to do for the patient. And almost every ICU involved had, uh, uh, CCT had C something like CCTV, cameras focused on the patient and on the monitor, so we could all chip in and yeah. try and decide how to treat the patients. So COVID did bring that awareness. It was horrible treating those patients without knowing what to do, but we got through that. 
post COVID, I can say definitely, without any doubt, that healthcare in Nigeria has improved significantly. When I got back 2008, there was no interventional cardiology. Uh, there was no uh, orthopedics at a high level like hip transplants, shoulder transplants. I mean, uh, replacements, those things didn't exist. They're now done in several places at a very high quality. Kidney transplant is also done at very high quality and a lot of other things. So pretty much everything that is needed healthcare wise is available, most everything is available here. It's just not all in one center. So you've got to know where to go, but things have improved significantly since, uh, when did I come? 2008. Okay. So, it's, uh, it's a major difference. So doctor, I mean like, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in this area, but I do know that um, information is very, very key in diagnosis and making the right decision, finding out. And one thing that I've experienced too is there are lots of, in, uh, there are lots of machines today that are available that provide doctors with um, better insights as to what is happening to people, like your CT scans and all those. Before, I think when I was much younger, it was only X-ray machines that I actually knew. But today, there's, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of improvement in, in that. Do we have that in Nigeria? And oh, yes, we do. It? Oh, yes, we do. We have a lot of diagnostic uh, capability now. CT scan, MRI, even PET scan, which is on the high, high, high end. We didn't have two years ago. Now there's at least one PET scan in Nigeria. What, what is the PET scan? Now, I wish you hadn't asked me that question. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to say it in simple English, but it, PET is positron emission. Uh, I even forgot the word T, 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 T is. The T. That, but it is... Uh, sounds expensive what, too. They put radionuclide... Uh, materials in you and then they can see usually where the cancer is growing where it has spread and the best way to treat it is the highest end of uh, radiological uh, diagnostics in the world so we have one now uh, tomography is the T we have one now in uh, in Lagos and the others coming up so it really transforms the management of cancer in Nigeria and it also helps with the heart so that's the highest end we now have it we didn't have it last year Two years ago but now it's here so almost every diagnostic uh, equipment is available here almost or not all right. not all but um, we have made a lot of progress so the diagnostics have improved significantly so and with the diagnostics comes the treatment so um, FCC I mean like FCC started as, as first cardiology, first cardiology. Strictly cardiology. now, now we're multi special so if you had a picture in your mind of where FCC will be in five years' time, and what will it be, and what is pre what will prevent you from getting there, or what is preventing you from getting there, and, and, and I'm sure those are the challenges that we face. I can start with what's prevent what will prevent us: funds, money. That's the major uh, obstacle because healthcare, the returns are not that big. It's not like going to the stock market where you can make 100% in one year in healthcare, it doesn't just work that way. Not in one year, but maybe in, in, in future years. Yes, maybe, but it, yeah. it's, it's, it's a slow process. Yeah. And um, because of the fluctuation of the dollar with the Naira, it makes things a bit complicated. But where I think we should be in five years, we're now multi-specialty. So our plan, the vision now is to go into the major multi specialties like orthopedics, nephrology, kidney transplant, ENT, neurosurgery. We want to get all that in place and then scale up to a bigger hospital and then have a franchise around the country where we'll be doing high level work. And we're already beginning to move in that direction. So Doc, doc I mean, one of the things that, one of the reasons why I don't like to go into hospitals or clinics or any is every time I go there, it's like um, Groundhog Day. You know, you go in there, they ask you the same question they asked you the last time you were there. And it's as if, you know, my records are not, are not, are not in one centralized place. Uh, and secondly, um, as you get older, you know, they say like, once you're past 50, you have to go for regular check, uh, regular check. So unless your doctor is proactive, you might let this thing slide. And I know they say prevention is better than cure. I mean, like, is there, I mean, like, are we going to see improvement in that? I think there's a term for it that you call it off um, outside patient. I can't remember what the word is. I mean, like just a whole onboarding process and just continuously okay. managing patients. Well, what you 
talk about asking the same question over again. Um, it has to be done. That's to prevent mistakes. Because now we've moved over to electronic medical records. Uh, it's no longer handwritten, it's all electronic, where it's typed. So people like also type one word per minute uh, to disadvantage. Uh, but it's all electronic medical records. But at least it's more legible now. You know, doctors are, are famed to. Yes, my writing, you can't read. I can come back and uh, I can't read what I wrote uh, a year later. But uh, yes, so there's electronic medical records. But the biggest fear is making a mistake with the patient's name because some people come there can be two Yemi Johnsons and uh, you've got to be sure you're talking to the right one and because medication for one could kill the other person so it is important it's just part of training it doesn't matter how good the med uh, electronic medical records is you've got to ask the person again is your name Mr. Ozoma? Okay, check, it's your date of birth, this. So you confirm that that is all correct. So that's why they have to ask those questions again, uh, unfortunately. Because even with AI, they're going to ask, double check that yeah. that's the right person. Yeah. And AI is slowly coming into, into effect in, uh, in our business. How, how yes. that, I mean, that's interesting. Like how, how, I mean, like, what role does AI have? What role is AI okay. going to play? Or what like, role is it playing? Someone right like now? me that has had a zillion years of experience, uh, AI can put all that experience, plus a hundred other people's experience, in into an alg algorithm and get come up with a better diagnosis than you can. All right, some days you're not as sharp, you haven't slept well, you didn't take coffee, you might miss a few things. AI will not miss those things. So I'm looking forward to AI really coming into it will reduce errors for yeah. sure. It will improve diagnostics and it will improve treatment. Yeah. So, no doubt about it. So in terms of procedures, have you ever? Have you ever done any procedure that you were not sure of and how did technology help you to actually, you know, Well, it? yes. Uh, or the use of I mean, basic technology or a sophisticated technology, anyone? Okay, well, let me give two examples. Uh, in what I do, interventional cardiology, where we put the catheters into your heart and then we take pictures with what, of what we see, sometimes the treatment is not obvious to one person. So we have all these platforms now. You just put your, your angiograms on the platform and then several other people from around the world. So you have, you have second, third opinions on the spot. There are all people around the world, experts who are experts in different specialties that you're involved in, will now give their opinions and say, okay, no, we think you should do this, you shouldn't do this, you should do that. Then it helps you manage the patient like you were abroad yourself because everybody's expertise is involved. The one interesting case we had was, I'm a cardiologist, I go into blood vessels, so I can get into any blood vessel in the body with a catheter. Mm. But my focus is the head and neck, that is where strokes come from, mm. and the heart. And then we go into the legs where people, you've seen people get amputated from vascular disease. That's what we try and prevent from going to the legs. So there was a patient who came in bleeding internally from the stomach that's not my specialty and uh there's only one guy available who came back a young diaspora who came back we call an interventional radiologist he was away that's his specialty he go in there into the artery and uh, puts coils into the blood vessel and stop the bleeding he was away in florida on a cruise and uh patient came in we had given like 20 units of blood already and uh, then he was pretty much not going to make it. So we called him. I said, look, I can get the catheter where you want me to get it, but I don't know what to do when I get there. So we put the thing on the screen. Uh, low tech, what's up? What's up? Uh, video. Video. And we also had CCTV focused on the screen. And then he would look at where the bleeding. He told me where to go. And I put the catheter there. Then I take a picture say, yeah, that's the artery that's bleeding. Okay, you need to do this. You need to get this catheter. And he put me through the procedure. I'd never done one in my life. I'd never even watched one done. But through that, I don't know if it's low or high tech. Tech. He was tech. Yes. He was able to put me through and the bleeding stopped and the patient survived. So Man. I felt quite good. Good. I told him, you know, we don't need you anymore. I can do this now. <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah. so those kind of things yeah. uh, do help. So I mean, I feel like I must get the movie right there. That's, that's, <laughs> something, that's something I had to remove it. Yes, it was, okay. it was, uh, it was, it felt very good. Okay, a, a couple of more questions. I mean, you know, like last week you sent out I think you posted something about, you know, 
um, heart look, attacks. Heart attacks. And uh, coming at a young, at a young, much younger age. Now, my question to you is that: Is it because now we're more informed now, so like we're diagnosing better, or is it that people were dying of heart attacks at that age a long time ago? But you know how we just the hand of God, etc. I think it's a combination of both. Mm -hmm. uh, we have these international cardiac conferences, and I'm quite well known from Nigeria for giving them some insights as to what goes on here. Um, when we go for these conferences, they tell you patients in India or in Germany will have chest pain. They know exactly what to do. They call 911 or 999, wherever they are. Ambulance comes, takes them to the hospital because it could be a heart attack. So they, they don't play with chest pain. So they ask me what happens in Nigeria. I say, well, first we reject it in Jesus' name. Uh, <laughs> we might go to church, we might go to the mosque, but the last spot of call is the hospital. After all those things I've tried, they go to Babalao, it doesn't still work. Then they come into the hospital when all the complications have set in. For a heart attack or stroke, you've got to get into the hospital for a stroke within four hours, heart attack within six hours to reverse the damage. But if you come after that, you're going to be dealing with the complications. And that's what happens. So I sent her that message because that particular week, I treated quite a few heart attacks and they were all relatively young, all under 50, including two women. So this thing is here and the incidence is increasing and we've got to be more aware. And please, take chest pain seriously. If you have chest pain, just come to the hospital. Make sure it's not something mm -hmm. serious. It might not be serious, but make sure first. Don't reject mm -hmm. it uh, and things like that. Okay, last final question. So um, if there's one thing that you would advise leadership in Nigeria to do that would help, should I say, begin the process of providing more health care or more health conscious uh, Nigeria, what would that be? I know the that's a political question. Well, no, well, yes. Yes, well, it is. Everything, we're all political. This is political season. Well, um, there's, okay, let me say what's going on that's good. Uh, people are beginning to invest in healthcare, including the government. So there are a lot of hospitals and facilities coming up with the infrastructure, with the equipment. The biggest problem is the professional uh, help. So the government's got to find a way of keeping our young talents from going abroad. And the reasons they go abroad are one, not necessarily money, it's quality of life. Uh, living, I mean, spending four hours on the road every day to work is just not sustainable for most people. So it's easier for them to go abroad. And you cannot do remote working when you're a doctor. It's difficult, <laughs> but it's, it's actually yeah. getting there. Yeah. A lot of consultations can be done yeah. by- uh, Remotely, yeah. Remotely. Uh, telemedicine a lot so we actually have a lot of consultants from different parts of the country helping us consult mm -hmm. uh, remotely uh, so that does work but it's how to keep the professional staff here you can and uh, that's the one thing how to improve quality of life of the healthcare professionals but i don't think you can separate that from the rest of the country yeah. everybody's quality of life has to improve so governance has got just simply got to improve dr johnson thank you very much for coming out to tech talks and we'll thank continue you. the conversation offline